everyone, today I'm going to show you how to give your footage a vintage or VHS type style in After Effects. And no, it's not going to be like the other tutorials out there where I just add color correction, tell you to download an overlay, and then go crazy with some chromatic aberration. I want it to be a little more authentic to the style of real VHS taped footage, so we'll be replicating some of the actual stuff that gives it its unique look, like interlacing and edge-based chromatic aberration. And don't worry, I'll explain it all as we go. Everything is going to be done in After Effects with no plugins and nothing to download, so let's just get started. First and foremost, we should change our video's aspect ratio from 16x9 to 4x3, which is what VHS footage was shot to. Figuring out the width that we need to set our composition to is really easy. All you have to do is open up Google or your phone and just punch in 4 divided by 3 times the height of your footage. And that's what you need to set your comp's width to to turn it into a 4x3 aspect ratio. Or what's actually easier is you can do it within the composition settings window itself because After Effects can calculate math inside of input boxes. Now that we've done that, the first adjustment we need to make to this footage is to apply two effects, a fast box blur and an unsharpened mask. When we combine these two effects, we replicate that look that VHS footage often has, where it's a sort of hazy, unfocused vibe, but the edges of objects usually have a dark, sharp outline. Oh, damn! So first we'll create a new adjustment layer, hit enter, and name it Blur and Sharpen. Next we'll add a fast box blur to it, and I'll set the radius to 1 and the iterations to 8. You can think of the radius as controlling the size of the blur and the number of iterations controlling the quality of the blur. You can see here if I set the iterations back down to 1 and then crank the radius, the blur gets bigger but it's boxy low quality blur. Then when I start to increase the iterations, the quality of the blur also increases. Next we'll just add an unsharpened mask. What this effect does is increases the contrast and sharpness on the edges of things using the difference in colors to figure out where the edge of something actually is. The amount controls how much to sharpen, the radius controls how big the edge area will be, and the threshold is used to control how edges are found. Increasing it means there needs to be more contrast between colors in your footage before the effect considers something an edge. I'm going to set the amount to 100, the radius to 10, and leave the threshold at 0, but feel free to toy around and pick the values that work best for your footage. One optional step you can do if you really want to bring back a little more detail is to add the sharpen effect as well and set it to something around 100. Now, something that I've seen a bunch of other VHS and vintage tutorials do that's just completely wrong is throw heavy chromatic aberration on the whole thing. If you haven't heard that term before, this is what I'm talking about. Now, there's nothing wrong with using chromatic aberration like that. If it's a look you like, then obviously go for it because all this is ultimately down to how you want your footage to look. But just from a more realistic standpoint, I don't think I've ever seen VHS footage that just has full chromatic aberration like this. Typically, you'll find it around the edges with high contrast. So to simulate that, what we can do is create an edge mat so that the chromatic aberration we add only appears along the edges with higher contrast in our footage. The first thing we need to do is duplicate our footage three times with Ctrl or Command D and apply the set channels effect to the top one. Then we'll go ahead and turn off the green and blue channels, leaving only the red one. Next, copy the effect and paste it onto the layer below, but this time we'll only have the green channel set to green. And lastly, we'll paste the effect onto the third layer and only have the blue channel set to blue. After that, select all three layers and change the blending mode to add, and you should see that our footage looks like it's back to normal, except now we have the red, green, and blue channels separated onto their own layers. So now we can nudge the position of these layers slightly to create that chromatic aberration effect. I'm more a fan of keeping it sort of subtle, so I'm only going to nudge the red channel layer 3 pixels to the right, and the blue channel layer 3 pixels to the left, and leave it at that. Finally, selecting these three layers, I'm going to right-click, pre-compose, and then rename it to Chromatic Aberration. Now, the only thing we have to do is create the edge mat so that the chromatic aberration is only seen around high contrast edges. Thankfully, that part's really easy. We just need to duplicate our footage again, rename it to edge mat, apply an effect called find edges to it, and then invert it so that the strong edges it finds are white. Next, we'll place the edge mat layer above the chromatic aberration precomp and change the precomp's track mat to luma mat so that it uses the edge mat's luma or lightness as a mask. And now toggling the precomp on and off, you can see that it only applies the aberration along high contrast edges. Alright, so next we're going to tackle something that I don't see other tutorials covering, which is faking video interlacing. If you don't know what interlacing is, it's very much a thing of the past that doesn't really exist anymore, but it was very prominent in the days of VHS footage. Putting it as simply as I can, back in the day it was uncommon to be able to send and display a full frame of pixels on a TV at once. Instead, footage was displayed on every even row of pixels and then the odd row of pixels. Now instead of using both the even and odd row of pixels to build up one full frame at around 25 frames per second, what most cameras did, including VHS cameras, was shoot at 50 frames per second and record the even rows of the current frame, then the odd rows of the next frame, and alternate it that way. And that's why if you pull up some old footage and pause it, you're usually going to notice these lines, unless it's been deinterlaced. So now with that in mind, in order to get a more realistic VHS look, we're going to fake some interlacing. 
To start off, I'm going to duplicate the footage with Ctrl or Command D, then right click it, pre-compose, and rename it to Interlace. Now let's add an effect called Venetian Blinds to our Interlace layer. If we go ahead and hide our original footage and then increase the transition completion, we'll notice it creates these vertical bars that almost look like interlacing. But if we set the transition completion to 50%, the rotation to 90, and then the width to about 4, we're good to go, sort of. If your footage and the composition are already 60 FPS, then you can just nudge the layer over one frame to the left, and then change the main composition to 30 FPS, and you should be good to go. But if your footage is 30 FPS, we have to get a little bit more creative, because just doing the same thing is going to make your interlacing way too harsh. So what we need to do is turn our 30 FPS footage into some fake 60 FPS footage first. To do that, double click your interlace pre-comp to open it up, and then we'll go to composition, composition settings, and then set the interlace comp from 30 FPS to 60 FPS. If we move forward frame by frame now, you'll see that the footage didn't just magically create frames and turn into 60 FPS footage, it's just showing a frame, pausing for a frame, then showing the next frame so that 30 FPS footage can be played at 60 FPS. But thankfully, we can actually fake motion in those paused frames by enabling frame blending. Now this pretty much does what you'd think it does. For those pause frames where it doesn't have any new data, it's blending between the two frames it does have on either side of it. So now if we move forward frame by frame, we'll see a real frame, a blended frame, a real frame, and so on. And finally, now we can just nudge our layer over one frame to the left and head back to the main comp, and we'll see that we've got some slightly more accurate and less harsh interlacing. This next step is optional because it's not exactly realistic, but if you keep it subtle, it can really bring the whole look together. What I sometimes like to do is swap out the interlaced footage with our chromatic aberration precomp so that instead of just regular interlacing, we get a faint RGB motion blur to it. Now, because we did all that groundwork for the interlacing in the last step, this is super easy to do. All we have to do is copy the chromatic aberration precomp and paste it inside the interlacing precomp. And again, if your footage was 60 FPS, then that's all you really have to do for this step. But if it's 30 FPS, we'll have to nudge our chromatic aberration precomp over one frame to the left in here. Now, you might notice that we don't have the ability to enable frame blending on the chromatic aberration comp, but all you have to do is open it up and enable frame blending on the footage layers inside of it. Now, if we head back to our main comp and toggle the interlacing pre-comp on and off, you can see that in areas of high camera motion, we get a chromatic aberration as part of the interlacing blur. Great, so with that sorted out, let's start color correcting our footage by creating a new adjustment layer, naming it CC, and applying the Lumetri color effect to it. Then let's expand the basic correction tab, pull down the whites, and raise the blacks to make our footage more flat. The values really depend on your footage, but pulling the whites down to around negative 50 and then raising the blacks to about 10 are a good starting place. Next, we'll expand the Creative tab and pull down the Vibrance. Again, much of this depends on your footage, but basically we just want to wash a lot of the color out to give it a more retro vibe, so I'll set mine to around negative 40. If you were wondering why we didn't just lower the saturation instead of the Vibrance, I totally get where you're coming from because I only recently looked into what the difference between the two were. But basically, the saturation affects all the pixels the same way, whereas the Vibrance affects areas that have lower saturation more than the areas with higher saturation. Which just means that when we pull the Vibrance down, the less saturation stuff gets dull, but the saturated areas keep more of their color. Another thing we can do in the Creative tab is we can shape the look by deciding what we want our shadow tint to be. I'd say the most common ones for vintage footage are going to be red and blue, but you can obviously pick whatever you want, and you can choose by clicking and dragging inside the circle to move the selection cross in the direction you want the shadows to go. And if you want to reset it, all you have to do is double click inside of the circle. The shadow tint can really make a big difference to the final look, so I suggest taking a look at some reference that you want to emulate or just experimenting and seeing what fits best. Next, what we're going to do is clip our highlights. To clip the highlights, I'm just going to grab the top end of the curve and then drag it down about halfway through the square it's in, and then drag it left to the line. These are, again, just starting values and it all depends on your footage, so feel free to tweak it. One last thing that's really going to help the overall look is to add a wiggle expression to the temperature value inside of the color correcting tab. Because something I've noticed in a bunch of VHS footage when doing research for this video is there's quite a bit of color shift over time. So if you want to add that subtle touch, just hold Alt or Option on a Mac and click the temperature stopwatch to open the expression box. Next, we can just write a simple wiggle expression like this to tell the temperature to randomly move up or down by 20, three times a second. And also, really quickly, if you're new to the wiggle expression, it's really amazing, and I've got a whole video on it that shows you a bunch of ways you can use it, so maybe check that out when you're done this one. And now with that done, that's about all I'll really do with the color correction. Toggling it on and off, you can really see it makes a pretty significant difference. And now for some final touches, we can add some distortion to the bottom, some warping to the sides of the frame, and then sprinkle a little grain on top. To get started, I'll make a new adjustment layer, name it bottom line, and then apply the wave warp effect to it. Next, I'll change the wave type to smooth noise, set its direction to zero so that it's waving horizontally, and increase the wave height to around 100, the wave width to around 20, and the wave speed to about 5. 
Now we should have some pretty gross distortion going on, but all that's left to do is mask off a small area at the bottom of the frame, and we can set the pinning to vertical edges so that we don't see those black edges on the left and right. Also, if you wanted to make those damaged VHS glitchy lines that move down, all you have to do is duplicate this adjustment layer and animate it moving from the top down. All right, so on to the next thing we're gonna wanna add, which is edge distortion. To do that, we'll create a new solid, name it edge warp map, and make sure it's comp size. Then add a fast box blur to it and set the radius to about three. We're gonna be using this as a displacement map and these edges here that aren't white will be what's being distorted. So I recommend turning the iterations down to one so that the blur is less smooth. Now all we have to do is create one more adjustment layer and name it edge warping. Then we'll apply the displacement map effect to it and set the target layer to the solid we just made, making sure we change it from source to effects and masks so that it includes the fast box blur we added to the layer. Next, we'll change the horizontal displacement to zero and set the vertical displacement to alpha so that it uses the solid layer's alpha channel to decide what to warp. Now we should see the edges on both sides have a slight warp to it and we can change the strength by increasing or decreasing the vertical value. And finally, the last thing we need to add is the grain, which is super easy. Again, I'll just make a new adjustment layer, name it grain, and then add the add grain effect to it and basically just tweak the intensity to your liking. I'm always gonna be an advocate for the more subtle side, so I'll just set it to something like 0.3 and that's it. Now again, like I've said a few times throughout the video, these values I'm using aren't an instant solution and you might need to tweak yours slightly, but hopefully I've explained what I'm doing enough so that you can can make some educated tweaks and get the values you need a little faster. Also, I feel like this goes without saying, but you don't need to break everything out into their own adjustment layers like I did. I just did it this way so that you could see all the effects more clearly in that if you wanted, you could disable the other effects while working on a new one and speed up your workflow. Anyways, that is all for this tutorial, so hopefully I was able to learn you a thing or two, and if you got any questions, feel free to throw them in the comments and I'll get back to you. And hey, if this is the first time you're seeing a video of mine, then let's make a deal. Head on over to my channel, uh, take a look around. Uh, watch another tutorial, and if you like it and learn something in that one as well, then maybe subscribe to my channel and turn on notifications. I don't know. Sounds like a pretty good idea to me.